Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the course, An Introduction to the History and Philosophy of Yoga. I'm Seth Powell, and I'm so excited to have you here with me today and to begin this six-week journey investigating the depth and history of the yoga traditions. How did yoga, which historically arose as a religious discipline practiced by male renunciate ascetics on the periphery of mainstream ancient Indian society, go all the way to today to be embraced by millions around the world, practiced today by predominantly upper middle class, white, educated, female practitioners. Well, let's turn now to the word yoga itself and to understand it a little bit better within its Sanskrit context. The word yoga comes from the Sanskrit root yuj, which literally means to bind, to harness, to connect, or to concentrate. And it's cognate with our English word to yoke. Really this idea of bringing or fixing, joining two things together. Yoga has a wider range of meaning than nearly any other word in the entire Sanskrit lexicon. The act of yoking an animal, as well as the yoke itself, is called yoga. In astronomy, a conjunction of planets or stars, as well as a constellation, is called yoga. When one mixes together various substances, that too can be called yoga. But this is by no means an exhaustive list. And so the word Upanishad itself sort of has this nice teaching embedded in it, uh, referring to sit down near, that is to say, a student sitting down near the foot of a guru. And indeed, as you can see depicted here in this much, much later painting, um, these Upanishads often uh, take the form of dialogues between a guru and a student, or sages and even the gods themselves. I also mentioned this idea of ancient inversions, this idea of the Vaguli Vata in Pali, this uh, so-called bat penance of hanging upside down from a tree like a bat. And this uh, seems to build on um, an important theoretical concept. This is a manuscript I actually got to look at uh, at Harvard University at their special collections at Houghton Library. And so this was a photograph I took. And I, I show you this to give you a little bit of sense of the manuscript culture of the Yoga Sutra. As it turns out, there's very minimal evidence beyond the text itself that we can use to ascertain any information about a historical figure named Patanjali. We know, however, from reading the text a few things. He was very clearly a Brahmin Sanskrit intellectual. This might also be familiar from last week when we encountered an early kind of proto version of these Sankhyan tattvas um, in the Katha Upanishad. And we saw this analogy of the rider in the chariot, right? The rider who the Katha Upanishad likened to the Atman or the self, but which the Sankhya and Yoga schools would term the Purusha. Tradition itself holds that the Vedic sage Vyasa, depicted here, um, narrated the Mahabharata story and told it to uh, the elephant-headed god Ganesha, who served as the scribe and wrote down um, the Mahabharata epics. I want to highlight this epic context because there's this huge narrative in the Mahabharata and the Gita is just part of that. It continues the story. Uh, and when the Gita ends, the Mahabharata story picks up. Now this divinity of Krishna and Arjuna's realization of it is fully revealed in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, where 
Krishna reveals to Arjuna his full cosmic or divine form, what's known as the Vishva Rupa. This 15th century Hatha Pradipika as an important touchstone upon which we can gain a valuable window onto what has come before, this important and valuable synthesis of verses, of ideas, uh, and techniques that were compiled by Svatmarama. Yoga has constantly changed, adapted, and innovated over the course of time. And rather than one singular yoga tradition, History reveals that there have been a multiplicity of yoga traditions. Thank you all so much and hope to see you again soon, either online or someday in person. Okay, so take care. Bye-bye.